If you want to find more birds, increase your skills, and discover new locations in the process, then eBird is for you. But how do you unlock the full potential of eBird? I use eBird for all of my birding, and today I'm going to show you how to take full advantage and take your birding to the next level, coming up. Welcome to another Better Birders video. I'm Caleb Stoyer here to bring you some of the best tutorials, tips, and tricks, as well as on-location videos about birding. So if you're new here, consider subscribing. Today we're talking about how you can unlock the full potential of eBird. eBird is an online citizen science database holding over 1 billion bird observations from birders around the world. Using these sightings, scientists can monitor bird populations around the world. Birders also use it to track down rarities, record the lists, all the while helping us get a better idea of bird populations. In this video, I'm going to show you everything you need to know from creating a profile to using the explore feature eBird has. To create a profile, you just go to eBird.org and then click on get started. Fill out your information and then create an account. I actually already have an account, so I'm just going to sign in. Alright, so I'm signed in. You'll see that this is my life list, complete checklist, and then species that I have that I've taken a photo of and uploaded onto eBird and species with audio. They also have your checklist streak, which is just how many days in a row you've submitted a checklist. First, I'm going to show you how to submit a checklist to eBird. You go up here in the top left hand side of your screen to submit. Choose a location. If you've never made a location, I'll show you how to do that. This is just all the locations that I've ever used in eBird, so it just saves them here to make it easy for you to go back and submit a checklist to that place. There are several different ways you can make a new location. The first way is to find it on the map, and you can just type in your county or state. So I'm just going to do Dallas. Texas and then this right here is all the hot spots that are in Dallas so the eBird community has already made all of these popular birding places so you can just select that location you only want to do that if you're actually birding at that location the blue points are going to be personal locations so like I can make that location and then I can always go back and submit another checklist to that to make a new location you just click anywhere on the map You'll have to zoom in quite a bit because they want an accurate plot of your location. Put a name, and then if it's like a place the public can go and see birds, you can suggest it as a birding hotspot. Then you just hit continue. Then you put in the date that you saw the birds, so we can do June 1st. And there's going to be four main types of observations that you would have made. There's traveling, stationary, historical, and incidental. Traveling is when you were actively birding and you walked greater than 30 meters. So you're going to do traveling if you were just stationary, like watching from a window, hawk watching, something like that. You're going to do stationary. And then if you don't remember the exact time, duration, and distance, you just use historical. You want to be as specific as you can because that helps out the science portion of things. And then if birding wasn't your primary purpose, you would select incidental. Well, let's go with stationary, and then you put in the start time. AM or PM. If it's, if it's a nocturnal observation, it's going to come up with this. This is also just a nice reminder in case you accidentally do that, then it would remind you because you want to be specific with the time. Then you put in the duration. This is just a hypothetical checklist. I actually didn't do this, so I'm just going to delete it at the end. Hit continue, then it'll take you to a list of birds that are likely for this location. You can either group by most likely, or you can just have it group by species. So you see that is the whole list, and then if you see a rare bird, you'll have to check the rarities, so then you can search for it. As you can see, some of these are going to be really rare. You can also so subspecies. I like to do group by most likely, because chances are you did see the most likely birds, so that's just going to organize it a little easier. So just type in your count. If you don't have an accurate count or you can't really estimate it, you just put an X. If you know the actual count, you don't want to do this because you want to keep it as specific as possible to help out the science side of things. But if you just heard, say, a couple indigo buntings singing and you're not sure how many, then you would just want to put an X there. So after you put everything in, if it's a complete checklist of the birds you're able to identify, you want to check that. If it's not, then you'll hit no. And then you just submit. You can always edit this later if you need to. So I'm going to delete this checklist and then we'll go explore the My eBird side of things. Alright, so we're in the My eBird part of eBird and this is where it keeps track of all your lists and checklists that you've ever submitted. I really like this part as it makes keeping your life list extremely easy. You 
can see the species that you found for each year at this time, and then you can also organize it by the end of the year. And then it'll show you all, all of the species that you've seen this year, and exactly when you first saw that species. So I really like this, and it makes keeping track of your list very easy. It also keeps track of the birds that you've seen this month, compared to all the other years. And if you scroll down, it'll show you what bird you saw in what state, what your state list is for year, month, and life. Now if we go over here to the left hand side, you can manage your checklist locations, and then I'll get to trip reports here in a minute. So if you ever want to do edit your checklist, you just go here, and then you can edit location, date, and effort, stuff like that. If you ever accidentally entered something in, you can also do the same for your locations. So now I'm going to show you what trip reports are. Trip reports is a fairly new feature in eBird and it allows you to make a report of your entire birding trip. This is a maximum of 30 days, however, so if you have a trip that's longer than that, you will not be able to do that. For our big day in 2023, I just made a trip report so we could see all of the locations that we went to and what species we saw. Keeps track of your lifers and photo lifers. And then if we were to click on here, it says like six checklists. So we saw a northern mockingbird at six different locations. And then if there is any checklist comments, they would also show up. A little check mark indicates that it's a lifer. I really like this just because you can get an overview of like say your big day or your trip. It's a lot of fun. And then you can put in a description of your trip. Just a nice way of keeping track of your trips. Next part is your profile. This shows you all the birds that you've seen in your state. So if you're on a desktop and you hover over a state, it'll show you how many birds you've seen there. And if you were to click on that state, it would show you how many birds per county you've seen in that state. And it's color coded. It's so like darker red means you're going to have more species. And then lighter yellow is going to be less species. So I really like it because it just shows you an overview of all the birding that you've done in that state. And it also shows you down here all of your most recent checklist, your media, and if you zoom out it goes to the whole world. Next part of the My eBird part is your media. So when you upload a picture or audio, you can also do video. To eBird it shows up here. So like this willow flycatcher was rare in Tennessee at the time, so I had to upload some audio and I also had a picture too. You typically want to do this to document birds, like this mountain bluebird was rare in Texas, so I put that on there, then you can rate it and other people can rate it, so then it gets sorted in the Macaulay Library, and then they can ultimately use that for science. You can also search other people's media, search by best quality, least rated, all kinds of stuff. I'll get to more about that later. So that pretty much wraps up the whole My eBird side of things. Before I continue on to the explore area, if you have any questions about eBird or birding in general, just leave those in the comments below and I'll be happy to get back with you. So the next part of eBird is the explore area. This is probably my favorite part of eBird. I use this all the time, especially when researching trips and other birding locations, as well as trying to track down rarities. You can also improve your ID skills in here, so there's a lot, and I'm going to try to break it down for you. So the first part is the explore species. You can search any species in the world and it will come up here also the four letter code name if you don't know what that is every bird has a four letter code name that is just the first letter in their names so like a gadwell would just be g a d w put it in there it's a nice quick way to get to a species black throated green warbler would be b t g w so if it's got like a long name it's an easy way to put it in there as you saw black throated gray warbler would also come up so sometimes there are some repeats but it's an easy way to type in a long species quickly. Fun fact, the bird with the longest name in the world is the King of Saxony's Bird of Paradise. And you can shorten that down to K-O-S-B. So instead of having to type all that in, you can t put in the code name and then it comes up right away. So what I like about this explorer species area is if you need to look up identification of a species, you can just search it in there and then it'll come up a bunch of pictures audio quick description and then a range map that is eBird sightings from around the world so it tells you where everywhere in the world that a willow flycatcher has been seen so that's the explore species area and then the next area that I'm going to talk about is the explore regions you can search any region in the world here we'll start with Texas type it in there and then it shows you all of the birds that have ever been seen in Texas. You can search by year. If you ever want to change location, you can do that quickly by going there. You can see the last scene, first scene. 
It's like a crescent-chested warper was recently seen in Big Bend National Park. This is the first report of it. Got a description and then a photo. So that's kind of fun to see what the newest birds ha have been seen in Texas. Photos, video, and audio uploaded in the last seven days. This is based on how many ratings it has and how high those ratings are. That's how they sort that. Recent checklists that have been submitted for this location. Top eBirders. I'll get to more about all this later. And the top counties. And top hotspots. I'll get to all that later. Just wanted to show you this location area. You can also search National Wildlife Refuge, BirdLife, IBAs, KBAs. eBird has some articles about what that means and major reason, regions. So like you can't search world in here. It doesn't come up. So, if you want to do that, you have to go to the major regions. ABA area, as you can see, sometimes that's helpful. National Wildlife Refuges, if you just want to see, like, sometimes the... If I want to search all the birds that have been seen at Seeing National Wildlife Refuge up in Michigan, I would do this, and then I can see top media, recent checklist, top e-birders, and then top hotspots within that refuge. So that can be really helpful when researching a big National Wildlife Refuge to try to figure out where I should bird. Next tool that I use in here is the species maps. You can search any species in here. And then it shows up showing where it has been reported. Darker purple means more reports. Lighter purple means less reports. You can search like year round past 10 years so you can figure out like if most of these reports are recent or a little older. What I like to do is if I'm gonna be in like a certain locate area for a certain time, I want to see when can I see, like, say, an alder flycatcher. So if I'm going to be in the area in July, I want to see where is the alder flycatcher at in July. can zoom in to the darker purple, which means there's more likely there are going to be more reports of them. Then if you hit show points sooner, it's going to show them when you're zoomed all the way out versus just having the darker purple. Click on any of these points, it's going to show you the hotspot name where it's at and then the checklist you can just click click on one of these checklists and it's going to say all the birds that were seen on that checklist that can be really helpful when trying to figure out where to get a certain species of bird especially if you're doing like a big year or a big day something like that i use this a lot when i was planning the big day i also use this when planning trips to like figure out where am i going to get certain birds so i use this a lot next is the explore hotspots i use this a ton especially when planning trips like i said brighter the red the more species that are going to be seen in that area then the lighter the yellow, less species. As you zoom in, you're going to see different hotspots for that area. So, like, I'm going to be in the San Juan Islands later. So, I just want to click on here and see, like, is that a good place to go? It's so like, I'm going to be in this area later this year. So, I can just click on that. So, it's going to tell you everything about that location from the species to the amount of checklists that have been submitted. It's a really helpful tool. And I use it all the time when I'm planning trips or just, like, trying to figure out where to go birding. Because it tells you right away how many species have ever been seen there. It doesn't tell you what and Unless you click on it and click on any of these checklists and then it'll tell you what birds have been seen there at this time so it's going to give you the date time everything like that it's so like i'm going to be in this area in august so then i can sort by the month and then it's going to tell me how many species have been seen reported there in august for the entire time so as you scroll down we can see all the different birds top media from that time the recent visits is still going to be the most recent from this date right now so that isn't going to change so this is really helpful when trying to figure out where you're going to go birding at i use this all the time all right so let's keep exploring the explore area the next part is going to be the macaulay library if you click on here you can search any species in the world and it's going to bring up pictures of them you can then search by best quality least rated newest oldest stuff like that and then contributor if you want to look up a specific contributor date location like you can do even do like a broader location like texas or indiana something like that and then here you can put in a lot of more detailed filters such as sound if you're doing audio behaviors it's so like if you want to see like an american bitter in flight you can either do the code name type it in or type it in and you can see what they look like in flight so that can help a lot when you're have an id cha challenge or something like when i saw an american bitter in teton county wyoming it was rare, but I wanted to see how it looked in flight because I didn't get a photo or video of it. So then just by remembering what it looks like, I can look at this. You can also check out videos that can show you what they look like in flight. That can be really helpful when trying to figure out an ID for a species. I also have audio. 
So that's a helpful tool that you can often use when trying to figure out an ID or just research different species to sharpen your skills. Next is bar charts. I don't use bar charts as much. I actually really rarely ever use bar charts, but it can be helpful depending on what you're trying to do. So you can search in California and then you can either do the entire region, counties, hotspots, or important bird areas. Then just hit continue and it's going to show you how likely that bird species is based on either that location or if you're doing broader like california like as a state this can be really helpful to see like canada geese are very likely in california year round it tells you the month up here and then the more green that you're going to see that's going to be more likely and the less green you're going to see that means less likely it's going to show you all species as you scroll down you can see like the violet crown hummingbird very rare in california just like a very rare visitor this can be really helpful when trying to figure out how likely a species is based on the time of year for a certain locations all right so the next part of the explore area is different alerts you can look at target species and this is going to be for like a certain region you can then search like for your tennessee list aba united states world like and then life list year list or month list or even day list if you wanted so we're just going to do June for my Tennessee life list. And it's going to show me how likely a certain species is in June in Tennessee that I haven't seen yet. So Orchard Oriole, pretty likely 13.89% frequency. That means if I'm in Tennessee in June, it's going to be pretty likely that I'm going to see an Orchard Oriole. That's based on like, that depends on what habitat you're going to be in. But it can be a good way to gauge how likely a certain species is in your given area. Can also click on the map and then it shows you all of the points that the orchard oriole has been seen in june for all years and since there's so many points i had to zoom in even more even when i had the show point sooner on if we click a hot spot it's going to fetch all the sightings location area stuff like that it can be really helpful when trying to track down a bird that you haven't seen in a state or even just area for your life list there's a bird that's not a super common visitor but you know visits your state and you want to find it this can be a really good way to get it the next part of the explore area is the alerts section. You can choose for rare bird alerts or needs alerts. Needs alerts is birds that you haven't recorded in a particular region on eBird. You can sort by this year only, only or your life list. You just put in the region. And if I put on this year only, it's going to show me all the birds that have been seen in the last seven days that I don't have on my year list for Cameron County, Texas. I like to sort by date so you can see the newest birds. It's like this yellow green vireo is rare. It's typically found in this location, but I haven't seen it yet for my Cameron County list, so it's still going to show up. But if I ha had seen it, even though it's rare, it would not show up. So if you want to see all the rare birds in your area, you can just search in, you can just type in your location or even just county or even state if you wanted search by date and it's going to show you all of the birds that eBird flags as rare now this does not mean that it's like super rare it just means that eBird has it flagged as rare which means not like this house finch here could be common in the area but could still be possible in the area but eBird has it flagged as rare because they're not typically seen this can be really helpful when trying to locate rare birds a lot of people will use this you can actually subscribe to it via email then you can choose whether eBird emails you every hour or every day so that you never miss another rare bird again you can also choose ABA rarities subscribe to it if you want sort by date and it's going to show you all of the rarities all of the birds that are classified ABA code 3 and above in the ABA area you sort by date you can see we've got all of these birds that are aba code 3 and above if you're doing an aba big year or something like that this can be really helpful when trying to locate rare birds if you've already seen this bird it is still going to show up you'd have to do needs alerts for that the rare bird alert in ebird is extremely helpful i was once in cameron county texas and i planned on going birding either way but i checked ebird rare bird alert right before i went and I saw that a surf bird had just been reported earlier that day, and I wouldn't have seen it otherwise if I hadn't checked the alert. Because people put in comments of like where the bird's at and stuff, so that can really help you when trying to track down a rare bird and let you know if it's still in the area. So the next part of Explore is compare your totals to other birders. You can do this through the top 100 yard totals or patch totals. For the top 100, just type in a region. 
then you can select a time period, select all time, 2023, or any other year. Then you can rank by species or complete checklist. So then you just hit show top 100, then it shows you the top 100 eBirders for, say, like 2023 is my example right now. So for 2023, I've seen 306. These people have seen more. But it's just kind of a way to compare with other birders. Two other ways is yard turtles and patch turtles. Yard is typically like your personal house yard. And then patch is your favorite birding area. So this can be like a city park, five mile radius, stuff like that. So I've got like Rio Grande Valley, South Padre Island, or like five mile radius to our old house, stuff like that. And it's just kind of fun to see, like, for me, I don't really compare a whole lot with this. With this, I just like to see, like, how many birds I've seen in the Rio Grande Valley or South Padre Island. Stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. Next part is learn birding skills. You can take the eBird Essentials course where the Cornell Lab of Orthonology walks you through eBird. You can also download the free app Merlin Bird ID. I've got a tutorial of that. You can click on it in the top right corner of your screen. And there's also a photo and sound ID quiz. I use this a lot, if, especially if I'm heading into a new area. You just put in the location. You can do your current location or you can do be as specific as you want. You typically want to be as specific as you can. And then you can either do photos or sounds. If it does sound, it's just going to play sounds of bird. If you do photos, it's going to show you a picture. Then you have to guess. It gives you five options as to what bird that is. It tells you if you're right or not. And then you just do tags and then you rate it. This just helps sort the Macaulay Library and keeps things accurate. Sometimes the pictures aren't great, so you just need to do like not identifiable to multiple species in the picture or no bird. So that's a fun way to increase your skills. I highly recommend doing it if you are going burning in a new location and you just need more experience with the local birds. And then the last part of the explore area is the submission map where you get to watch real time as birders around the world submit their checklist. As you can see, the gray dot is where a checklist has already been submitted today. It tells you how many have been submitted. And then a yellow dot shows up when someone submits a checklist. This can just be kind of fun to watch. The next part of eBird is the science area. This includes eBird's famous status and trends. And this is where your bird sightings help researchers assess bird populations. To see an in-depth video on this area, click on the top right corner of your screen. If you're not a scientist, don't worry, it's still fun to look at. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.